Trump remains a bit of a riddle wrapped in an enigma. Where are the flashpoints we should worry about in 2017? And first of all, the report by the US intelligence agencies, the bits that have been made public, I mean, it does suggest that Russia really played a very strong role, actually, in the US election, quite an extraordinary role, whether it made any difference in the voting as a matter of contention. Well, I don't think there's much doubt that uh, it made a difference. I, I certainly don't... Well, Mr. It. Trump doesn't think so, is right, what I was trying it, to say. Look, they had a very concerted, very well-directed, very successful 16- and 18-month um, intrusion into the Democratic Party's emails, for which I blame the Democrats. I mean, they were as sloppy. I don't know how sloppy you are, but we're all pretty sloppy with our emails. They, they really have themselves to blame. They left themselves completely wide open to, to state intrusion, and, and Putin's people do that sort of thing extraordinarily well. So it, w it was very effective, but and it had to have swung some votes toward Trump, but so did a lot of other things. No, nobody's saying Putin is the reason that, that Trump is the president, but he, he enters with this, this very cloudy relationship with, with Putin that I think is going to be problematic. I mean, it is, it is extraordinary in our lifetime to have any American leader being that close to the leader of the Kremlin, particularly somebody who used yes. to run the K be in the KGB. It sounds like science fiction. I mean, if 10 years ago someone would have told you a Republican candidate elected uh, with the help uh, of uh, one uh, KGB agent, I mean, that would have sounded like uh, know, yeah, crazy. Yeah, that script will never work. Will will never it? work. No, it's, it's just so ridiculous. unrealistic. But actually, we need to brace ourselves because we are entering a very, very dark year. I think that 2017, especially in Europe with all these elections uh, and the uh, clear evidence that Russia has been uh, waging a cyber warfare to influence the American elections of all countries, it's uh, something that might uh, really put us uh, on alert. We got a number of elections in uh, Europe and uh, Putin has been already trying to meddle with uh, Germany, uh, opinion public in many, many ways. Has been doing in all the former uh, voice of uh, pact countries. It has been doing everywhere. So we need to be aware that this is a year in which uh, what we have taken for granted, the international law and order, the kind of force of the law, is going to be replaced by the law of force. And it's, uh, you know, we, we know that Francois Fillon in, uh, in France is quite uh, uh, you know, receptive to Russia playing a bigger role in, in Europe. We know that Putin is playing what could be seen as a very weak hand, but playing it very well. Well, exactly, that is exactly what American diplomats will concede, that Russia had a, a weak hand, as you say, played it extraordinarily well. You remember that in December of 2015, when Russia decided to intervene militarily in Syria, there were warnings from President Barack Obama that it would be another Afghanistan, in other words, a quagmire where Russia will get bogged down. But what has happened instead is that Russia, President Putin, has had the projection of military force and forced the conclusion he wanted. I spent most of 2016, or a lot of 2016, going to one security forum after another with Western leaders say, you know, you, we will not accept the changing of borders in our time by force. We will not accept that the post-1945 order will be changed. It, Russia is, to, went into you, Crimea, it still is there. Russia not only shifted the momentum on the battlefield in Syria, saved President Assad's forces from collapse on key front lines, it is now the key, so it's the key player on the battlefield, and I was in Aleppo during the last stages of the, of the war for that, uh, that in, important city. And then he shifted to the negotiating table. It was Russia and Turkey which negotiated the evacuation of fighters from Aleppo. It is Russia and Turkey which is now driving the new impetus for a new, possibly a new round of talks to take place not in Geneva or Vienna or Paris, but in Astana in the Russian orbit. It's extraordinary. Even British diplomats will concede that uh, Vladimir Putin went from zero influence in the Middle East in, in 2015 to now being the major player with the military force and the political will to back it up. So much so that even Gulf states are saying, we wish our ally was president. I was going to ask you about that, Lise. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf mm -hmm. states, and also Iran. The impact of Russia really putting its weight about and being successful, has that changed things? It's always been asked whether Russia and Iran see eye to eye in Syria. They don't. They have, they have a, a, a shared interest in seeing 
President Assad, or at least his his regime remaining, but they have different strategic interests. Russia wants to maintain its military bases. Iran wants to maintain its corridor uh, to Lebanon, to Hezbollah. It wants to maintain the presence of Shia forces, of which there are many, many forces in there. But the big question is going to be, once President Trump it becomes, it enters the mix, he seems to want to work with President Putin, but he also wants to undermine Iran's influence. And you, if you're going to work in Syria, it's hard to get, it's hard to, to square to square that circle. Ind indeed. How, I mean, how do you see President Trump's relations, potential relations with Mr. Putin, do you see that as a worry that Britain should be concerned about that? I think I think one should be alive to some of these concerns, absolutely, because I do think that there are uh, people who have been in in the in the Trump entourage who have said things about Putin that call, that, that give me cause for concern. Certainly, so there are others in the in the Trump transition team who've been quite robust towards Russia. So it is it is an area of concern. But um, we should take one step back. Many of the gains that uh, President Putin has made, which cause me concern, indeed heartache are as a consequence of the weakness shown by President Obama. We had an opportunity to intervene in Syria in 2013. The British Parliament, much to my regret, chose not to. And he said, Obama yeah. said, forgive me, this in the past yes. week, that was the reason yeah. you didn't do it. Well, quite. But, 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 but actually, the President of the United States could have shown a greater degree of resolution and clarity at that time. And I do think that it is... You know, it's a great shame that uh, in the final days of his presidency, there's been an element of, of displacement activity on the part of President Obama and John Kerry. They have concentrated the United Nations on resolutions about Israeli settlements rather than accepting that uh, they play um, a much bigger role in the eclipse of Western power in the Middle East and the unhappy consequences that Lisa has alluded to with Gulf states now looking to Russia for um, a role, they play a bigger role and carry a heavier weight of responsibility than anything that President Trump, President-elect Trump, has to uh, 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 have on his conscience at this moment. And Greg, how far do you buy that? Because the, the, the other way of looking at that same story is that after Afghanistan and after Iraq, Obama did not want to get involved in some kind of protracted con conflict, which he thought might be... Which in the, uh, polls, the opinion polls yeah, told I think And the opinion and the polls Congress, told yeah. MPs here the same thing, too. I think there's a consistency to the eight years of Obama's foreign policy. It's, it's, it's been a bit ambiguous in Afghanistan, but he has not wanted more interventions, and I think he inherited uh, a truly disastrous situation from, from the prior administration and has spent eight years trying to cope with it, and now it goes, it goes back the other way. It, it's a very confusing time for American foreign policy. Six months ago, Obama was proud of what he'd accomplished and proud of what he'd not been dragged into, and I think that's no longer the case. He, he, they were very... I, I was a, with some U.S. diplomats the day Russia went into Syria, and they were, as Lee said, quite convinced Putin was making a disaster strategic error, and it, it's paid off in spades for Putin. He's, he's, he's managed it beautifully, I believe. Do, do yeah, yeah, go ahead. But, but on the other end, I mean, uh, if we want to be slightly more optimistic, it is true that this new um, international uh, scenario does put a lot of pressure on the Europeans. It is true that the bombing of civilians by the Russians uh, in Syria has caused uh, all the European uh, leaders to really think long and hard, what are we going to do if America disengages uh, from mm. Europe, if America decides, as uh, Trump has said, that he doesn't want to pay any more for NATO, the share that America pays, then the Europeans, by necessity, they have to come together in order to ensure their own security. But, uh, but at the last European Council, there was no discussion of what had been happening in Syria and no resolution to deal with <coughs> what Russia had been responsible for. And it's only in the United Kingdom that there is a live debate about the need to increase defence spending. And as we discussed earlier, no, that's Philon... not correct. I'm afraid yeah, there's, 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 not, there's, not, there's, not, there's, not, there's plenty, not correct. Plenty of smaller countries if you have been that. watching uh, European Union politics, you would see there has been an acceleration in terms of a common defence spending, common research, and that the de facto more, more, more spending, policy, but mm. not more men and more material. It is the case <coughs> that the Baltic states are concerned. Yeah. But if you look at who is putting forces on the eastern border of NATO in order to defend, it is America, Canada, Britain. And one of the concerns that, um, 
that I have is that the European Union, for the reasons that we discussed right at the very beginning, mm. is turning inward. And while there is a belief that there should be institutional change within Europe, what there isn't is the resolution in dealing with the anti-democratic forces that Putin has marshaled. But, no, but, but I, I we've come full this. circle in our discussion. It's interesting. We started off by saying that, Michael's saying that, but how there was huge internal issues to resolve, and there are in, all, in the major European Union uh, players. But they're going to be forced to, to confront the problems of their their unity or the lack of it. When President Trump talks about NATO, you've got to pay your own way. What about when President uh, Trump starts talking about let's ease the sanctions on Russia over Ukraine? Mm. The EU, particularly Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, were leading the way in terms of dealing with Russia on the issue of Ukraine. These are red button issues for Europe in terms of European values, European principles. They cannot simply let them drift away. And I expect that uh, if Marine Le Pen doesn't win, if uh, as it looks like uh, Francois Fillon might have a chance, mm. then that's going to be really the key moment in which we could see a real change in Europe, especially on defense and security issues, because France is very keen, and that mm. will have also a strong influence on Brexit negotiations, mm. because Europe doesn't want to let We've Britain just got go one, one, one minute left. I just, I just wanted to ask you if we've, we've missed what could be the really scariest story of the whole year, which is China, North Korea, mm. uh, South Korea, the relations there, and Donald Trump's attitude to China. I mean, we don't know what he's going to do, mm. but that's very interesting. And, and Trump's attitude toward nuclear proliferation, which so far has been, hey, it's no big problem. Does that change once he's in the Oval Office? We don't know yet. He hasn't clarified his, his point of view with regard to, to any of He that. was very robust about North Korea, though, wasn't he? He was... Uh, uh, I'm judging from his tweets, of course, rather than major hmm. policy statements. Right, statements. and I think whatever Obama told him rattled him that, that, that first day when, when Obama first met with, with Trump a day after the election. But um, it, Trump expresses a willingness for, for Japan and South Korea to get nuclear arms. He's, he's gonna, what he said would overturn decades of non-proliferation. Well, on that note, Happy New Year. <laughs> uh, that's it for this week. You can comment on the program on Twitter at Gavin Esler, and you can engage with our guests and complain if you like. We're back next week at the same time. Make a date with Dateline London. Bye-bye.